Hi, everybody. Father Bill Holzinger here, pastor of Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Beaverton, Oregon, and this is your Friday Reflection. Now, typically, Friday Reflections are about, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes, something like that. Well, the last couple ones have been 20 minutes, and that's because I'm in a, well, a, I call it a catechetical series on faith and science. And as a review, often people have made the claim that they're in conflict with each other, but I'd like to propose that actually they're in harmony with each other, and particularly the Catholic tradition of Christianity is very in, harm, in harmony with, with science. And why do I say that? Because there's a lot of Catholics who have been pioneers in science. So if we're so against science, what are we doing, right? Yeah. So last time we, I think the last person we ended up with uh, was Cassini. I was going through a list of different scientists who are Catholics and uh, just trying to help us out to recognize what actually you know, the church has done for science. And again, you might remember there's some books I might encourage. One of them is called um, How the church, Catholic Church Saved Western Civilization. Another one, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths. Just those are books I'd recommend. There's some others I mentioned, but just kind of a review for that. And the last person we did talk about was, I think, uh, Cassini. So now moving forward, let me get him up here. The next person on our list of scientists who are possibly pioneers in some areas is Francesco Lana Terzi, SJ. Remember, SJ stands for Society of Jesus, that's the Jesuits, that's right. So his dates are 1631 through 1687. He was a mathematician, a naturalist, and aeronautics pioneer. So this is one of the key areas I wanna to get to because he's actually considered the father of aeronautics because he was able to take math because he was a professor of math and then merge that with the study of aeronautics and be able to then do measurements and you know refine the study of aeronautics he's famous for the flying boat and he even got a stamp just like some other people did in his country so there's a picture right there of his stamp so that is francesco lana terzi and of course you know i do need to do this because of my particular fascination with some science fiction, I think it's important just to touch a little detour, not a Catholic, but an amazing person, Jean-Luc Picard. Jean-Luc Picard was born in, with they say, 2305, as the story goes, and who knows, he probably died more times than anybody else on Star Trek, right? He was the captain. It was a captain in Starfleet and an admiral, we find out, in the new series. He was a musician, a poet, and he was the first to encounter Q, right? And he loved, what was his favorite drink? Maybe you know. You said Earl Grey, you got it right. Anyhow, so that's Jean-Luc Picard, but really I don't really want to talk about him. I'm just kidding around. I want to talk about another Jean Picard, which probably they borrowed from to create a legacy. And that was Jean Picard that was born in 1620 and died in 1682. Now, this gentleman was a French astronomer. He was the first to uh, measure the Earth to a reasonable accuracy. That's right. He was able to then uh, discover, or he developed, I should say, the idea of right ascension for measuring objects. So when I bring my telescope out and I want to find something, it's not just about just how high something is in the sky, but more importantly, where it is also what they call right ascension. As we perceive things, as we turn our scopes to the right, uh, we then can find things uh, and put those two together and we can find pretty much anything that's mapped out in the stars. So that's that's Jean Picard, not Jean-Luc Picard. <laughs> and our next person on our list is Blessed Nicholas Steno. And I found some amazing information about this gentleman uh, because he was uh, on a website that I did not expect. I didn't even know this existed, the Society of Catholic Scientists. So you might look this up yourself, catholicscientists.org. And if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read what is uh, written about him here because there's a lot more information. And I'll do my best to pronounce the word the, the word anatomy. A person that is anatomy is an anatomist. So sometimes I say that wrong. <laughs> so blessed Nicholas Steno. Steno uh, made fundamental contributions to four branches of science, anatomy, paleontology, geology, and crystallography. He was Danish by birth. While still in his 20s, he was already recognized as one of the leading anatomist in Europe. His anatomical studies greatly increased knowledge of the glandular lymphatic system. Various parts of the body were named after him, including Stenson's duct, Stenson's gland, Stenson's vein, and Stenson's, I'm not going to probably pronounce this right, Stenson's foramina, or foramina. 
He also did important work on heart and muscle structure, brain anatomy, and embryology. He traveled to Florence, where he worked in, research in, in a research institute that included some of, the, uh, some of the Galileo's pupils. In 1666, while dis, uh, dissecting the head of a great white shark that had been caught near Livorno, he noticed that the shark's teeth strongly resembled the so-called tongue stones common to, on Malta. This led him to develop, after much geological inves investigation, a detailed theory of the origin of fossils and, and, and of sedimentary rock that was controversial but correct. Steno's theory of sedimentary rock was based on three ideas, the, quote, law of superposition, the, quote, principle of original horizontality, if I'm pronouncing that right, and, quote, the principle of lateral continuity which are now recognized as the fundamental principles of stratigraphy. stratigraphy. There's a lot of the, these areas of science. Uh, some of these words are hard for me to pronounce because I'm not an expert of them, so I don't say them much. Steno was thus regarded as the founder of the study of fossils and one of the main founders of this science of geology. In fact, some people call him the father of geology. Steno's theory of how geological strata were laid, uh, laid open uh, excuse me, Steno's theory of how geological strata were laid down opened the way to understand to, to understanding of history and the age of the earth. The study of geology led Steno to the study of crystals, and he discovered the basic fact known as Steno's law, that in all crystals of the same mineral, the angles are the same. Steno was raised as a Lutheran, but a deep study of theology and the writings of early church fathers led him to embrace Catholicism. He became a priest and soon afterwards a bishop. In his last public lecture as a scientist, he made the statement, quote, Beautiful is what we see. More beautiful is what we comprehend. Most beautiful is what we do not comprehend, unquote. As a bishop, he was known as an ardent advocate for the poor, for whom he sold all of his belongings, even his bishop's ring. He practiced rigorous asceticism, constantly praying and fasting. And on October 23rd, 1988, he was beatified by Pope John Paul II. His feast day is December 5th. Gregor Mendel, we probably know a lot about him. And in fact, I won't get into great detail other than say his dates are 1822 to 1884. A lot of you already know a lot about him. Uh, but did you know he was an Augustinian priest? He, of course, was a scientist, and we consider him the father in, of modern genetics. Another person, here we go. This is Father Giambista, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this again, uh, Giambattista or Giambattista Riccioli, a Jesuit, SJ. There we are. His dates are 1613 to 1663, and he was the first to measure the rate of acceleration. So what's he doing if he's Catholic doing science, huh? Next is Father Roger Bosovich. His dates are 1711 to 1787, and he accomplished in uh, he's accomplished in atomic theory, optics, and mathematics. He's considered the father of mo the modern atomic theory. The next on our list is a woman named Maria Gatena Ganesi. I think I pronounced that right, possibly. Her dates are 1718 to 1799. She was a mathematician and a philosopher. She was appointed as a professor of mathematics in a university. And she's credited with writing the first book on discussing both differential and integral calculus and was an honorary member of the faculty at the University of Bologna. She's devoted, she devoted her last four decades of her life to studying theology, especially patristics. That's the study of the early church and charitable works, and serving the poor. This extended to helping the sick by allowing them entrance into her home whenever she set up a hospital. She was a devout Christian and wrote extensively on marriage, between the, the marriage between intellectual pursuit and mystical contemplation. Next in our list is uh, one of my favorites, because, of course, I like astronomy, and this is Father Angelo Secchi. He's a Jesuit. And his dates are 1818 to 1878. And he's an Italian physicist and astronomer. And he's considered one of the founders of astrophysics, which is kind of cool. So what was his deal? What was his uh, gift or his contribution to this field? Well, he was the first to really um, classify stars 
by their spectra. So uh, before all this, what astronomers would do is they want to look at where these things are moving, uh, how they're going across the sky, and where they are in the sky. So that's like where they are. What he was able to discover or to reveal was what they are. In other words, the, the light that was coming from these stars can be broken through a prism into spectra. And those spectra give us a, a sense of what chemicals are being uh, burned by that star. And so from that, he was able to do, then determine what the type of chemicals or what kind of star this star was. Why was it burning in a certain color? It was because of the spectra. And so that has been, you know, since his time, been advanced upon and now we can even use these, this ability to look at the spectra of stars to know a little bit more about where they're going. Because before it's just kind of what we see in the sky, left or right or up or down, right? But now we can determine from their spectra whether they're coming towards us or moving away. Yeah, coming towards us or moving away. Pretty amazing, huh? And that's because of a redshift. And it's using what we consider the Doppler effect. You might, um, when you're like near a train track, or a car goes by, or an airplane goes by. It makes a sound that's high-pitched coming towards you and then lower-pitched, goes lower-pitched as it goes away from you. And light has a similar characteristic. So looking at that type of movement within a spectra of a star, we can tell, or experts can tell, whether it's moving away or coming forward towards us. And not only that, how fast. Pretty impressive, huh? So thank you, Angelo Secchi, for your groundbreaking work on this regard. And we're going to move right along to the next person. And that would be Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, again, you may know much about him, so I'm going to just give some basics. His dates are 1822 to 1895, and he was a fresh French chemist, and he created the first vaccine for rabies, and he's considered the father of pasteurization. The next one is one of my favorites. This is Father George Lemaitre. And just recently, some video was found, which is amazing. This is like the last couple of weeks or the last month, maybe, of George Lemaitre in a conversation and an interview, which we've not even, we don't know what it sounded like before this. So we have that now. Ce mot création, au fond, ça entraîne toute une résonance philosophique ou religieuse qui n'a rien à voir avec la question. Derrière ce mot création, qu'est-ce qu'il y a Il y a tout simplement que... L'apparition de l'hydrogène, comme la suppose Hoyle, est quelque chose de tout à fait fantastique et inattendu. C'est pour ça qu'il a employé le mot création. C'est absolu. His dates are 1894 to 1966. So what's his big deal? So he was a Belgian priest, a physicist, and an astronomer. And he was the one, in, after discussions with, uh, with Einstein and looking at his, his theories, was able to then determine that the... The universe is expanding. Now, before this, this was a controversy because before this, there was this idea that the Earth was steady, and they call it the steady state theory. A gentleman named Fred Hoyle uh, was a kind of a champion of this theory, and between him and George, Father George Lemaitre, they had these let's say debates, as they do in science, right? And sometimes uh, they would, well, let's say Father Hoyle would make some comments that were rather, well, unbecoming. Meanwhile, Father Lemaitre was able to then think, hmm, if things are expanding, what happens if we turn things backwards in time? That means things are going to be shrinking, right? And to the point where he called it a, where everything came together in one small spot and an infinitesimally tiny and massive spot called like a, a, a primordial egg where everything started from. It was Fred Hoyle, when mocking this idea, that we get the theory, or this idea, I should say, the term of the Big Bang. Because from this infinitesimal spot, everything expanded, or you could say exploded. But it wasn't just stuff that exploded. Time and space, actually, you could say, exploded. This is why we call it a, a, the Big Bang. But it's really the entire what we know as reality expanded time and space. From this, then, became controversy. And it was only a little bit after this that some other scientists were looking through a radio telescope and they couldn't figure out why there was so much noise in the scope everywhere they looked, no matter where they turned the scope. And they realized after cleaning it out and other things that maybe this is the remnants of the Big Bang. Because this was then also said, if there was a Big Bang, 
there should be the remnants of it to be able to find. And that's what they did, which pretty much shut down this whole idea. And the Big Bang Theory has ever since been the leading theory of our of cosmology. And the idea of the steady state theory uh, has been pretty much put to rest. Of course, this was also this Big Bang Theory was then actually measured and, and seen and uh, uh, more calculated by somebody named Hubble, right? You may know of him. So now there is this term that used to be called the Hubble constant, but people forgot about Father George Lemaitre who pioneered all of this. And so now it's called the Hubble Lemaitre constant. So thank you, George Lemaitre, Father George. Next on our list are two sisters. That's right, religious sisters. The first one was a sister of mercy, Sister Mary Celine Fassenmeyer. Her dates are 1906 to 1996. She had a PhD in mathematics in 1946, and she wrote the thesis, Generalized Hypergeometric Polynomials. Hmm. That's not something that we had in algebra in high school, that's for sure. And I didn't have it when I was at Oregon State as a math major or, or doing math education. Yeah. So anyhow, she because of her studies, she has this um, whole set of polynomials named after her. They're actually called Sister Celine's Polynomials. You might look that up if you want, if you're really a geek and want to know about that stuff. Next would be then Sister Mary Kenneth Kell. Her dates are 1914 to 1985, and she was a Sister of Charity. She was the first American woman to receive a PhD in computer science. Pretty cool. She founded the computer science department at Clark College in Iowa and helped develop the language BASIC. And I'm very thankful for that because that's the language that I learned when I first started coding on computers as a junior high student. We just called it programming at the time. She had a BS and an MS in mathematics and a master's of science in physics, as well as a PhD in computer science at the uni from the University of Wisconsin. She is no, or was no dummy, that's for sure. Next on the list is the scientist, Father George Coyne, SJ, that's Jesuit, remember that. So his dates are 1933 to 2020. That means he recently passed away. So he's a contemporary for most of us. Coyne was a visiting assistant professor at the University of Arizona Lunar and Planetary Laboratory, as well as a visiting astronomer at the Vatican Observatory. Eventually, Coyne was appointed the director of the Vatican Observatory by Pope John Paul II in 1978. And in that same year, he also became the associate director of the Steward Observatory. During 1979 and 80, he served as acting director and head of the Steward Observatory and astronomy department, and thereafter continued as the adjunct professor at the University of Arizona's astronomy, astronomy department. In 2009, he was given an award by the American Astronomical Society in recognition of the diversity and scientific richness he brought to the astronomical community through his visionary leadership of the Vatican Observatory, Observatory Summer School and its long-term mentoring program and for the unique role he had played at the juncture of science and religion. Again, he's kind of the wonderful, these guys are wonderful like um, ending points because of the next one anyway as well, because this is where we're talking about. Is there a conflict or is there a harmony? So Father George Coyne did a lot to further uh, the education of people and this uh, engagement with the faith. And just to make the last, not the least, I even brought in my buddy, Snickers to help out, right, Snickers? <laughs> the last person on this list is Brother Guy Casalmagno. He's the current director of the Vatican Observatory, and he was born in 1952, has a PhD from MIT, and his, his vitae there is quite extensive. He was awarded in 2014 the Carl Sagan Medal for Outstanding Communication from the American Astronomical Society. I had the opportunity to actually get to meet him when I was on a retreat with the Vatican Observatory Foundation, and we had some neat discussions. I remember one where we were talking about the Big Bang, and he cautioned all of us. He goes, yep, this is the current, the you know, the current theory of cosmology, but who knows, 100 years from now, there may be something completely different. And I think that's... Um, I think that's telling because that's kind of a good scientist that these theories that we get are theories for, in science and they can be improved on or maybe codified better or strengthened, but who knows what will be next. But I think that was pretty cool that, you know, he speaks that way. 
I would also like to draw your attention to just two of his works because he's written several books and edited many more. And also there's many talks that he's given. But the one book I mentioned earlier was Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? And other questions from the astronomer's inbox at the Vatican Observatory. And you can find that almost anywhere. And then the audiobook, Galileo, Science, Faith, and the Catholic Church. This is a series of talks he gave. It's about five hours long. Uh, I found them fascinating. I think each section, each talk is about 20 minutes. And uh, you can get that at, let's see here, learn25.com. That's learn25.com. You can also go to Amazon and you can check out their book section there, audio books that is. And then finally, I think you can find it on Audible as well. If you know those places, you just go for it. It's really great. Finally, I want to thank all of you for being part of this three-part series of Faith and Science Talks as part of my Friday Reflections. If you have any questions, you can email me at the parish website or the parish email address. That's fatherbill, F-R-B-I-L-L, at h-t.org, or my own personal email, fatherbill at fatherbill.org. And again, um, I will do my best to respond to you as I can and as I have time. And until then, I'm going to lead, lead or end you with some websites you might want to check out. And uh, I think you'll find them fascinating. God bless you. And I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. What is he doing? <laughs> That's Snickers under there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh...